Hello, and welcome back to the Jungle Histology online training series. My name is Ken Longenecker, and this is the eighth of nine modules designed to teach anybody who's interested how to perform the methods my colleagues and I use to describe the reproductive biology of reef fishes. The topic of this module is going to be the relationship between the size of a female and the number of eggs that she produces. I'm going to walk you through the steps necessary to produce the data to fill out the last 12 columns of your data sheet. And all of that data is going to be used to estimate batch fecundity or the number of hydrated or stage 4b oocytes released in one spawning event. And we're going to estimate that number by trying to figure out how many of the largest size class of eggs there are in a mature ovary. The first step is to take a subsample of what visually appear to be mature ovaries. Now you've already seen some of this process in the methods overview module, but now we're going to take a much more detailed look at how you take this subsample. To refresh your memory, we're going to start at the point where we are fixing whole gonads in specimen bags. Wait at least 24 hours for that fixative to work and remove the gonads and the tag from the bag. Weigh the whole gonad record that weight. Next you'll take subsamples from gonads that you judge to be mature ovaries. Now to remind you, testes are pale and creamy colored and tend to be triangular in cross-section. Ovaries are rounded in cross-section and yellowish and the immature ones will not have any sort of granularity, that is you won't be able to distinguish eggs. But in a mature ovary, or a probably mature ovary such as this one, if you look at a cross-section, you will be able to see individual eggs. You'll use the results of histological analysis to determine if you should actually analyze these fecundity samples. So right now you want to err on the side of collecting too many samples. Later on, you'll discard the ones that weren't truly mature. Take an approximately one centimeter cross-section from one lobe of the ovary. Weigh that sample and record its weight. Take the sample and cut it in half. Add it to a container along with the larger portion of that two-part specimen tag. Add a solution called Gilson's fluid that's going to help liberate the eggs from that ovarian sample. Cap it off and get ready to do some shaking. The Gilson's fluid will begin working on its own, but you're going to help that process along by shaking it every day. Next day, shaking again the next day, shaking again the next day, shaking again the next day until it looks like all the eggs are free. And here's the recipe for that Gilson's fluid that I keep mentioning. And I want to highlight this one ingredient. Unfortunately, it's classified as a marine pollutant. Now, of course, we don't want to go around doing rapid reproductive analysis, trying to improve the state of fisheries and then dump a toxin into the marine environment. So we want to be sure that we dispose of this stuff properly. And here's the address of a website that provides two methods of dealing with mercuric chloride. Okay, so now we've gotten to the point where we've subsampled a bunch of what appear to be mature ovaries, We've put those subsamples into Gilson's fluid and we've been shaking them for days and the eggs seem to be liberated from the ovaries themselves. It's likely that we have many more samples than we're actually going to need to analyze and that some of those aren't truly mature. What we need to do now is decide which of those subsamples are the ones that we want to take a look at. And we do that by looking at our data sheets and finding the specimens that had 4A or 4B stage oocytes. 
And this is the reason you are recording egg stage or oocyte stage back when you were looking at the slides to do your size at maturity analysis. You'll decide which fecundity samples to analyze by going to your data sheets, looking at egg stage, and only choosing the specimens that have reached stage 4A or 4B. And for each of those specimens, you'll count the number of the largest oocytes in the samples. Here's a short video to show you how to do that. So I've taken our uh, sample of um, a subcycle of an ovary that was in this uh, tube along with some Gilson's fluid. I've pulled out the tag and then I've diluted that whole uh, subsample up to 400 milliliters. That's important. One of the things that you need to always keep track of is what your dilution is. And I've found that 400 milliliters works quite well. Uh, the next thing you want to do is fish out the tissue that was surrounding the ovary because sometimes eggs are clinging to that. One of the things you're going to notice that I'm doing right now is not using any sort of metal instrument. That's because the Gilson's fluid is highly corrosive to metal. So you'll see me using here, I'm using plastic pipetters. I have some zip ties that I might be using. Sometimes when I'm working I take um, bamboo skewers that are uh, used for uh, cooking things on a grill. Um, any of those make very good tools to tease the eggs out of the tissue that was surrounding the ovary. The other thing that you're going to see that I'm doing right now is working only with the volume of liquid that's in here, the 400 milliliters. If I add anything to this dish, it's going to change our dilution, so we don't want to do that. A little bit later on when I start taking subsamples over here, we can add liquid to it and it won't matter. Uh, because you'll just be diluting that subsample then. But well, before we start uh, actually taking uh, subsamples with a special pipette that I'll show you in just a little while, we're not going to want to change that volume. So uh, when I tease these eggs out, I'll dump this back into the container and use this liquid to uh, rinse the eggs back out. Okay, all I'm doing right now is examining this tissue and making sure that there's no eggs clinging to it. And if there are, I just gently wipe whatever tool I have to be happen to be using across the top, and that frees up the last of those eggs that haven't been uh, dislodged by all the shaking that we were doing over the past couple of days. Okay, so this one's looking clean now. I have a waste container over here that I'm going to dump everything out into. Okay, it seems like this did a really good job of, of uh, getting the eggs out of, uh, out of the ovary sample or subsample that we had. I'm really only seeing just a few still holding on. Get ready to count your eggs by preparing a special dish. This is just a plastic petri dish or a plastic watch glass. And what I'm going to do is take a ruler and run some lines across it. Use these lanes to keep track of where you are as you're counting the eggs. So this is a diamond pen. You could take the point of a pair of scissors. You could probably take a razor blade down through here. Um, it's very easy to scratch this. So you're just making a way so you can keep track of, of the eggs that you counted. Basically, you end up with a little scored glass. And then when I'm moving it under the microscope to count, I'll just move this one under the objective and then just zigzag back and forth. Uh, make, try and, uh, my best not to shake eggs across lanes. The next thing we're going to do is use a special tool called a stemple pipette. And what the stemple pipette does, basically you push this down put it in the water after you've stirred up the eggs, 
release it and this little area in here makes a chamber that holds exactly one milliliter. What I'm going to do is actually use the stemple pipette as a stirrer in here. Stir up the eggs, try to get them evenly distributed throughout that 400 milliliters of liquid. And then just release. Okay, and then trapped inside here, we have one milliliter of liquid and whatever eggs happen to be in that one milliliter of liquid. And what we're going to do is count the number of eggs that uh, came up with this stemple pipette. We're going to do that 10 times. Basically what we're looking for is an average and we'll use that average then to calculate the, the fecundity of this individual. We're going to put this up on our microscope. And then what I'm looking for is to decide first of all what is the largest size of eggs in there. And sometimes you'll see different groupings of eggs. Some will be very small, uh, some will be kind of medium size, and some will be quite large. And those probably correspond to the stages uh, that you would have been scoring tissues on the microtome. So I see one, two, three sizes. I'm just getting a uh, just getting an idea of uh, what that largest size is so I can decide which ones I'm going to count when I go through here. Now typically there's not very many eggs in this one milliliter sample, but sometimes it's a little bit easy to lose track, so we have one of these clickers that's, that's uh, available to, to help you. You don't, have to, you don't have to count the numbers in your head. Just as you see an egg, click, 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 and when you're done, you look at the numbers on there. Next I'm going to take the stemple pipette. Stir it around to resuspend those eggs. Take another sample. Uh, always watch to see if you've got a, a full sample in here. Sometimes something gets stuck in here and uh, water leaks out and you'll see bubbles in here. It's very obvious or sometimes it all leaks out. Um, so you've got to make sure that that's uh, completely filled with liquid on the inside. Again, taking it over here. Letting it loose, washing any clinging eggs off. We've already looked through once to decide what the egg size is, so now I'm just going to go ahead and start counting. I'll record that. And finally, be sure you discard that egg count subsample. You don't want to return it to that big dilution jar because that would change your dilution volume. Now we need to turn the data in those last 12 columns plus the data in the whole gonad weight column into batch fecundity estimates for each of those specimens. And we'll do that with this formula. First we'll need to find out the average number of eggs obtained in those one milliliter samples that we got with the stemple pipette and we'll multiply that average by the dilution volume. Then we'll take that value and multiply it by a separate value which is the weight of the total ovary divided by the weight of the subsample that you took. Now, don't worry if this all seems a little bit overwhelming because we made a spreadsheet that will automatically do this calculation for you. All you'll have to do is insert the data and you'll get an automatic estimate of fecundity for each of the samples that you analyze. And here's an example of how that works. This spreadsheet's already filled out with all the data that's been collected so far. We're going to scroll down to see the specimen that we were working on. That was specimen number 76. And all you need to do is start filling out the columns or the, the data cells then. First, the dilution volume. Remember that was 400 milliliters. And then we start entering each of the 10 egg counts. And you can see over on the right, you're calculating a average number of eggs. And then on the fecundity column, you're getting an actual estimate of the fecundity of that individual. 
by the time you've finished entering those 10 egg counts, we have a pretty good estimate of what that fecundity would be. And here we see in this case that our estimate for that one individual was 44,112 eggs if we round up. After we've got batch fecundity estimates for all the mature females, what we're going to do is relate batch fecundity to the length of the individual. And looking at this formula, you can see that batch fecundity is related to length in the same way that weight was related to length. This concludes Module 8. I'd like to take some time to thank our funders.